and uh, this is a workshop on racing the file system. So I appreciate you're all here instead of going to Andre's talk. Uh, I'm pretty amazed actually that more than five people turned up to this material because this is certainly not, um, nobody even thinks of this stuff usually, unless you're a database writer. And uh, yeah, it's, it can get really mind warpy after a while. So hopefully I'll be able to cover some of that during this, this very short hour. I could do it with about three hours, and even then, I could barely scratch the surface of the fun that is file systems. Uh, but I'm, this is going to be a workshop, so uh, it's going to be very, very straightforward, very simple. And if we run out of time, I'm going to skip all of the complex stuff and kind of skip straight to the end, because there is a potential boost library that makes most of the complexity go away. So you should just go use that rather than trying to do it yourself. But this will explain how the first principles work. So that's the plan, at least. All right, and thank you very much for turning up to this rather than Andre, because he's a lot more entertaining than I'll be. <laughs> so the contents of this presentation are going to be uh, basically, what is a race? I hope you all know what a race is, but I then also explain what is a filing system race. Why do they matter? Who cares? Most programmers don't. Most programmers write code assuming the file system never changes. And then you find out much later on when some horrible thing happens, you get pinned for the blame, why, why they do matter. I think I'm gonna cover some mostly portable race-free idioms and patterns that are useful for working around platform-specific um, lack of support. I'll then talk a bit about proposed boost AFIO, and then finally, I'll just give a quick idea, uh, quite, yeah, pardon me, a quick idea of exactly what you can do with this stuff, why any of it's particularly all that important. So when you do have um, a good conceptualization of, of races on the file system, how to work around them, what, what kind of interesting C++ stuff can we do? Because after all, it is a C++ conference. So what's a race? 101 comes high. You all remember this, I'm sure, from your very first lecture at university. There are two types of race, data race and a race condition. Most Programmers, um, once they've got enough experience, don't really think about much difference between the two because they're so interlinked. So data races will cause race conditions. Race conditions can cause data races. They're actually two separate things. And the main difference from our purposes, and I apologize for the lack of a proper academic explanation, single biggest difference is basically that the first one is often can be automated to the diagnosis. So classic ones, Clang Thread Sanitizer, Trial Grind, Hell Grind for uh, data races. Second one's a lot harder. There's no real way of automating this. You just basically got to get a really experienced, skilled programmer. And they got to go at it until they figure something out. This is even more 101, come say. So imagine to yourself, there are two threads or two processes. And these are running concurrently without any particular synchronization. So what you got up here is x equals reposition zero. And at the same, exact same time, you have another x equals read position zero. We then go x equals x plus one, and concurrently we go x equals x plus one. We then go position zero equals write x in thread one, and in thread two, we also say position zero equals write x. Of course, the classic outcome, which hopefully no one in this room is in any way whatsoever a doubt about, is that position zero is only incremented by one, not two. Any questions? Good. So, what is a filing system race? Almost exactly the same as what you just watched. The difference is, now thread one is doing a p read v from a file descriptor into some arbitrary int x uh, from position zero. And later on in the same thread, it's doing a p read v same file descriptor, into a new variable called y, and let's say it's position four. And from another thread over here, we're doing a p write v in between this p read v, so it goes p write v in another thread, and it's overwriting the first two locations in this file descriptor. So the first eight bytes is what's being assumed here. And what you get then is that the x being read here no longer matches with the y being read here. And this produces the classic outcome where thread one sees one version of x and a different version of y, and you basically have a torn, torn read. So the write comes in 
gets in the way of these two. Yes? Can you explain that to me again, please? So the question was that uh, he's saying here that x is four bytes, y is four bytes. Uh, he's saying here that the p write v on this side would overwrite the first eight bytes of the file. Is that correct? Because it is. Um, that's because of my nasty pseudocode, uh, which is completely not valid C or C++. Uh, so the, the point was made was that uh, he had misread it. Yes, uh, I have cut a whole lot of corners to fit onto, onto the slides. I chose this nasty style now because later on um, I'm gonna have a lot more code on, so I just made it even more compact and I kept it consistent throughout. But no, um, the idea is here that the first eight bytes are being overwritten as an entirety, but because you've got a, a split read and then a split write, so it's reading the second half of this one and this first half is coming from what was ever there before. I'd. Does that make sense? Okay. So here's another problem with uh, file system and race conditions. This is a problem with concurrent path changes. This will catch a whole load of people out, as we'll see later. Really expert people, even. So imagine to yourself that thread one is using in the root path name slash nile slash store, and we open a file descriptor to set path plus file one. Over in the another thread, we're going to rename slash nile slash nile dot old and then rename slash something else slash nile. So over here, we read slash nile slash store slash file one from this nile and we're now reading slash nile slash store slash file two from slash other because it's been renamed in between the two. So now thread one gets mismatched file one and file two. Does that make sense? You might wonder, so what? I'm gonna find out, so what? <laughs> Here comes another interesting one. Deleting a directory tree. It's one of those things that you sort of do in second year comp sci, and you don't really think much about it. So it works very simple. You enumerate the directory contents. For every directory that you see inside the directory you're enumerating, you recurse back into yourself and you go and do another enumeration. Afterwards, you come back out of recursing into the directory and you delete the directory because you know that step three, which was executed inside the recursion, has deleted all the files already. And this is correct for POSIX, this works. This is a standard depth first traversal algorithm for deleting a directory tree. But guess what? It's incorrect on Microsoft Windows. And here's the crazy thing. You can go look at a whole load of professionally written code out there, and it gets this wrong every single time on Microsoft Windows. I saw this pattern in Python, and you think the people who write Python know what they're doing, but the directory tree algorithm in Python in the past was incorrect. It simply used the POSIX semantics. It does not work on Windows. It's not, it's not safe. It'll work 99% of the time, but it's racy. It is actually incorrect. I'll show you what the correct algorithm is, because asking you all what, what the correct algorithm is might be a bit unfair. So this is the, actually the correct algorithm for Microsoft Windows. What you do is instead you enumerate the directory. For every non-empty directory, you recurse. For every file, you try to rename it to some random name in percentage temp, and percentage temp I mean some environment variable expands into some temporary location on that particular drive. For every empty directory, you rename that also to a random name in temp, and then delete. And then you loop all of these until a directory tree is deleted. Can anybody tell me why this is correct on Windows? Say again. The comment was as uh, system read only files? He suggested it might be locked. There's actually an even more fundamental reason than that. Can anyone take a guess? Hands. something very peculiar about Microsoft Windows in the audience. 
You suggest that file delete is not atomic. You're getting very close. The comment was the updating of the directory tree, even closer. No one quickly got to it. The weird thing is you could ask this question in a room full of file system experts and still you wouldn't get the right answer. I'll tell you what the right answer is. It's very funny. When you delete a, a file on Microsoft Windows, you don't actually delete the file on Microsoft Windows. You mark the file to be deleted at some later point whenever Windows gets around to it. Normally, that's less than a millisecond, but it can be seconds. Depends. The reason for that weirdness is because really Windows NT is actually VMS underneath the bonnet. VMS kernel from Vax VMS days. And Vax VMS was a U US Department of Defense secure filing system. So what happened was that when you went and deleted a file on Vax VMS back in the day, we're talking 80s, 70s, it would go off and it'd say, I have to now scrub all of the contents of this file and make sure it's completely securely deleted, and then I'll delete the file. Because Vax VMS is the same kernel as Windows NT, it still has the same semantics. It still will take some arbitrary period of time to actually delete a file. And that time is not, not instant. It can surprisingly vary. I've seen it myself with my own testing. If you have a lot of load on the operating system, a lot, a lot of load on the filing system, it can take, oh, 10, 15 milliseconds to delete a file. And of course, you can't delete a directory while there's any actual file within it. So this will actually fail randomly. Unless, of course, rename it first, and if you're allowed to rename the file while it's open, that's great, and then you can delete it and delete out the tree, and then when the files actually do get deleted, because they'll get deleted eventually, everything works. So here's the actual algorithm, correctly marked out. Replace any notion of deleting on Microsoft Windows with mark for later deletion, and suddenly everything needs to make sense. And of course, I've mentioned here that you need to have all the files have to be opened with file share delete, which is, uh, because by default on Windows, if you open a file, you don't allow anyone to rename or delete it. But if you specify the file share delete flag, then it lets you rename and delete it. Although, mark for later deletion is the actual correct thing. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, this is actually a curse. Terrible, it's not POSIX. Turns out you can do a whole load of really cool stuff hacking, <laughs> using these semantics that you do stuff in Windows that you just can't do in POSIX. But uh, I don't know if I'll actually get onto that in this particular talk. Is there any questions? So, moving to that, renaming that, moving to that folder or temp is the enemy? I put in percentage temp to indicate some sort of environment variable substitution. It does, actually doesn't matter where you put it as long as it's not in the directory tree that you're deleting. Uh, in my own algorithms, I just move them up uh, to the directory above the tree that I'm deleting and you mark them all as hidden and with random file names and therefore usually in Explorer you don't see them and they just eventually silently delete themselves off without anyone noticing. It doesn't matter where it is as long as it's not in the tree that you're deleting. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Uh, the comment was it can take time to copy a file to another disk. You're not doing any copying in this situation because when you're trying to delete a directory tree, you're, you're moving. So you're always renaming. So you're deleting the entire thing. You don't want to copy anything. You want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Yeah, but I mean, you can rename, move the file to any arbitrary folder so you can copy it to the The comment is you can't move uh, the file to some arbitrary folder, any arbitrary folder, because it may be a different amount of partition. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. And implied in this is that percentage temp is somewhere definitely on the local drive. Um, you can just assume that that is guaranteed to be true. Is that okay? Cool. Any other questions? At the back. Is it just that uh, the two locals are referring to two different subdirectories now, or is there something within that open that's sh like shared? So the question was, uh, you had some confusion over why uh, the fact that these two files are being loaded from two lo separate locations might be a bad thing? Oh, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood, if, if, is that what we're talking about when we say a mismatch? That they're from two different locations? Yes. Okay. So the question was this. For example, the reason why this would matter is say, what happens if file one is a user database of passwords and file two is a set of ACLs 
for security for those usernames, and then you swap out the actuals just at the last moment with the database of users. Do you see where we're going? Sure. Yeah, and in fact, that's a whole class of uh, security vulnerability. Any other questions? Okay. So here's the thing, you're kind of probably getting an idea now. There's lots and lots of horrible things that happen with the file system. They're all really non-obvious because we're not really trained to think about them. Trouble is, ultimately, we get taught at university that the file system is just exactly the way you see it. It's not going to suddenly change out from underneath you. Microsoft tried to in uh, introduce a, an idea of transactional NTFS um, back with Windows Vista, if I remember rightly. And they rolled this out with great fanfare because it was you know, a huge thing that we could all go do. And uh, guess what? Nobody used it. Microsoft were really upset. They spent a huge amount of time developing this wonderful system. And uh, nobody used it, so they ended up having to deprecate it. Again, in Windows 8, I think. So they've now marked all of these APIs as, you know, we're going to have to get rid of these into the future. Mainly partially because they're not particularly compatible with REFF, REFS, which is the new reliable filing system, which Microsoft are going to replace NTFS with. Uh, but equally, just nobody used them. It's a real shame, because it's painful to implement. It's kind of funny, because Linux is currently going off and implementing transactional filing system extensions. And the next question is, if they didn't use it on Windows, which is a huge operating system, very, very popular, is anyone going to use it for Linux? And I don't know is the answer to that. Um, anyway, I mentioned there that there's a whole class of security vulnerabilities. And they are called top tows. So that expands out into time of check to time of use. These are very famous. These are Unix's riddled, was riddled with these in the past. So here's the, the basic thing. Thread one checks whether this particular path, so imagine your, your, your process is some set UID um, root, root level process, and you've got some path that's coming in from wherever, a configuration file. You're checking to see if the access to this particular file is, is, is okay by the thing that's calling you. So is there permissions to do this? And then afterwards, when you said, oh yes, well, they're definitely, it's good, you open the path and you write something into it. Usually some untrustworthy input. Now what happens there is you have a malicious program. A malicious program in some other concurrent context will suddenly relink out just in between the check and the open some new path to the path location. And this is a classic, classic security vulnerability. Uh, the classic one is the password file. So what you do is you send something to a set UID program and is capable of writing to root level files and then you suddenly swap out the password file just at the last moment, and you overwrite the password file with any arbitrary thing, including giving yourself root privileges. This is a massive thing, and in fact, this has a whole page dedicated to it in the CVE, CWE. So uh, that's the page with the link, and these are just, I just copied the first four, so you can see there's a denial service attack. PHP has an arbitrary code execution flaw, all due to Toctow. Here's an arbitrary file modify, arbitrary file modify. And uh, up to 2008, they, they did a pretty big purge uh, from about up to 2010. They went right through and audited all the code, and they managed to pull out an awful lot of this stuff. But then it kind of gave this big impetus that we need to come up with some APIs that don't have this problem in the first place, which is exactly what I'm getting to next. Any questions? All good? Cool. OK, so here's our design ideas. We aren't going to go and think about the filing system as being in a static, unchanging place anymore. But because that's kind of hard, what we're simply going to do is we're going to say, never use an absolute path. Just don't do them. Anytime you're writing an absolute path, slap yourself really hard in the hand and just don't do it. So what do you do instead? Use an open file descriptor slash handle as a base for relative path operations. I'll show you how to do that now and next in the next few slides. Next thing to do is to combine these relative path system APIs with the design patterns that are about to come for the rest of this presentation, and that will let you do various race-free behaviors of various kinds. So POSIX takes one approach, and the main approach by POSIX is that it has a whole lot of extra APIs that were added to POSIX that allow race-free file system behavior. And they're collectively called the dot at so star at functions, because every single one of these ends with an at. And they all do exactly what their previous thing does without the at, just that the at ones take an input directory handle. 
You can get these on Linux, FreeBSD, RSX, I think even QNix now has them. Um, anything that implements POSIX has a very good likelihood of implementing these, although um, they have caveats. Let's just say the consistency of implementation isn't as portable as it could be. Microsoft Windows, as always, is a bit different, but not that different, surprisingly enough. If you skip the Win32 layer, which you want to because it's terrible, <laughs> and you go straight to the NT kernel API, which is fully available to user space processes and is documented and is not actually as illegal as people seem to think it is, you can program the NT kernel with no Win32 at all. It's beautiful. You've got all the same app functionality as you get off POSIX, so you can pass in some base handle to a directory, and you can do relative path lookups, and it's wonderful. It's, it's really, really beautifully designed API. I really wish POSIX had just copied what Windows NT did, because it's spot on. The only thing is that because we have DOS programs, and DOS programs get race conditions too, and people exploit them, that they added a whole lot of extra baggage. So one of the big problems is you can't rename a directory containing any open file handle on, on Windows. You've already probably seen this in your own code. Another really one, interesting one, which most people probably haven't seen, is that you cannot rename a file into a path where any path component has any open handle on the system with the privileges to rename that item. So in other words, the upshot of all of this is you can't change paths that are being used on Windows. They have a whole lot of locking in way to stop that from happening, and that reason why is because all the programmers were writing it assuming that the static, unchanging filing system, so Windows makes it static and unchanging. And that guarantees that you're never going to get surprised. It matches programmer expectations. Here comes the first pattern. Using relative paths instead of absolute paths. So earlier on, we're, we're all very familiar, I assume, with opening a file. <laughs> You'd hope so. You just open it with the path. Earlier on, I showed that you could have split file opens where one file being opened was mismatched with another file. This now goes away. So what you do is you open the directory that you want to go and access. You then use open at using the directory handle to the directory that you just opened for file one. Internally, the kernel will take slash now slash foo or whatever the current path is and append on file one and then open it. And that way it's completely erase free. In my own code, I have this um, unit test. It's more like a soak test. I suppose it's really an integration test. And what it does is it creates a whole set of directories and it opens a whole lot of files in those directories. And then it does file system changes within those directories while another thread is permanently renaming all of the directories underneath it as fast as possible. And that verifies that you really, really are, even under conditions of very heavy load, um, this stuff's safe, works perfectly. So you can no longer slice file opens, which is great. Here's the next pattern. Just don't use paths at all by using direct by FD operations. So by direct by FD, what I mean is this. Here is creating a hard link. So what you're doing is you're creating a hard link to this file, nile slash foo slash file one to slash file two. Instead of doing that, which is racy because we're using an absolute file, uh, absolute path, you open a file handle to slash nile slash foo slash file one, which is file one FD. You then specify a null string as a destination. You then specify this magic constant, which means that for this path, we're going to use an absolute path after all. And then we put slash file two. And then we use this magic macro extension, which simply says that I permit empty strings just here. Because this is actually, as it turns out, an extension by Linux to the POSIX race-free APIs. And what that let does is it lets you take, we don't care what the path of that is right now. It could be anything. It could be changing right now very rapidly, doesn't matter, we're going to link it to slash file two. Completely invariant to any, any form of change. This is supported on Linux and Windows, and um, yeah, it's great. You just forget about paths, don't think about them anymore. Any questions? Okay. As I mentioned, this is an extension that Linux provides and Windows provides it naturally. So here's an example of a call where it has not been extended in such a fashion. So when you come to unlink a file, you can come along and you say slash now slash foo slash file one. We're just going to unlink it, make it go away. But then what happens if someone is in the process of permuting slash nile or slash foo and renaming it all over the place, you'd end up deleting the wrong file, which could be a security vulnerability, an attack, any form of malicious problem. 
So what you simply do is you assume you have here a file descriptor that's open, the file you want to delete, and again, you pass in that I want to unlink that. That's what this API could do if Linux had implemented it. I have it open as a bug tracker on the Linux kernel, and uh, they might implement it, they might not, but currently only Windows currently does it. So the question becomes, is if we were building, say, a library, say, a boost library, and this boost library needs to implement direct by FD deletion on all platforms, how are we gonna work around the problem that the system is deficient? So what do we do? We do an interesting pattern called inode checking. So here's the thing. All of the major operating systems currently available on the market provide a magic proprietary, totally proprietary uh, API for looking up the current path of an open file descriptor. So Windows has one, Linux has one, OSX has one. OSX has a particularly bad API actually. It's, it has a tendency of overflowing buffer and corrupting memory because <laughs> the API is really badly designed, but we'll skip that part. The point is, is there's, there is an API that's available. FreeBSD has the interesting notion that it only works with directory handles. So only if you have an open file handle to a directory can you retrieve its path. If it's a normal, regular file, FreeBSD currently can't do that, and that is by design according to the kernel folk. So you have the ability to open for a current file. POSIX guarantees that you can have any file I know that has the same stdev and sdi know is the same file. So you now have the beginnings of the primitives you need to do uh, race-free um, path traversals effectively using this inode checking pattern, which works as this. So let's just say I have an open FD to any particular location, we don't care where. What the algorithm simply does is it goes and gets the current path of that file descriptor, splits the path into a base name and leaf name. You then do an fstat at on the open the directory, do an fstat at to try and pull in the fstat for the uh, leaf name, and then you compare the stdev and the sti now. If they're equal, you've just discovered the correct parent directory for that particular file. If they aren't, then you've had a race. So what you do is simply loop back and try it again. And you just keep looping, 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 looping until you eventually get it right. Not particularly efficient under conditions of lots of change, but is rare actually in, in practice that a file system is changing that much. It's just it could be changing at any time. It is reliable. And here's, of course, the great advantage, because you can now do sibling lookups. So I'm sure you're all aware, well aware of storing a, some data into some store file, and you might have some index. So the classic one would be the mail program on uh, Unix, or even my own email program, which is Pegasus Mail. So it keeps an index into a flat mailbox. And you need to race free lookup its index, which is always going to be stored alongside it, even under conditions of paths being changed very rapidly. And this, this, this pattern can do that. So we've worked around the first problem. You can also do race-free deletion. So if you need to delete a file and you only have an open file descriptor to that file, and you've no idea where it is and can be renamed at any moment, and there's a potential for data loss because you might delete the wrong file, you've solved this because all you do is you open up race-free open its, its parent directory. Once you've got the parent directory, you can do unlink at, using that parent directory handle, you can unlink the leaf name. Again, by comparing the inodes to make sure you've got the right one. That's, of course, slightly racy, but it's not race. It's race-free up to the point of the containing directory. Question? Sure. I believe I missed a bit. So the bit that's missing, oh no, I did actually put it in. So you split the path and you open the parent directory, that would then go into DRFD, and you get an fstat at, so some, this is your base, and then you're finding the leaf name within that base. I think there's actually a bug in there. Go on. Let's say that you have multiple hard links to the same file from the same directory. Do you need to break them all? So the point was that what happens when you have multiple hard links to the same file within the same directory? and you are correct, that would indeed be a bug. This is why uh, in the library I only make any race guarantees whatsoever up until the containing directory. So it's up to that DRFT. After that, anywhere from there inwards, you're completely on your own. Um, you're interested, you make a valid point that if you have hard links that span directories, 
you can get some very interesting cases that pop out that hurt the head after a while. Hard links um, are surprisingly complex when you let them proliferate. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry. I have one over there, my apologies. <laughs> Go on. Well, if it, so the question was, is there not a, uh, a problem with time in between getting the path, splitting it, and then doing the direct reopen? And the answer is yes, there can be, and it doesn't matter, because when you do the fstat at, sddev and sdi will no longer be equal. You've got an interesting point, though, because what happens, imagine this, this starts to get a bit head-wrecky. You may not be aware, some of you, but x4 has a nasty habit of reusing inode values of stuff that's just been deleted. So what can happen, unfortunately, is that you can delete an item. So you open your thing, you're in the process of opening it, it gets deleted, and then it gets reopened again. Uh, sorry, so the file with the inode gets deleted, and then it gets recreated, but now to a different file. And then when it comes to compare the stdev and the stinode, you now have correct values, but you're now referring to the wrong file. And the reason why that is never allowed to happen is because you must never ever close <laughs> the path. Ah, uh, this thing's always had my finger over it. You never close the path of the item that's here, and as long as you keep the handle open for that file directory to the original file is inode is pinned and it will never be recycled by any operating system. But if you were to go off and close the FD while running this, then yes, you would run into that particular race. These are the fun, fun parts that you can have. Any other questions? At the back. Say it again. So the question was, if you keep a file descriptor open to the directory, it will never recycle inodes. Uh, sorry, I misexplained myself. It's if you keep the f file descriptor open to the item that you are checking mm -hmm. and then have a directory, uh, file descriptor to the directory, you'll never get the inode recycled as long as you have an open file descriptor to the item because it should never be deleted. Should be, is the case. Um, you're right that on some filing systems where they emulate the inode number, then that can be more interesting. But they're not POSIX compliant, so that's okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So you now can do sibling lookups. Yay. So here comes the next pattern. This one should be familiar to anyone who's ever had to do anything on Unix at any time. So this pattern <laughs> is, uh, <coughs> pardon me. This pattern is atomic renaming. So this is a classic one that you always find that whenever someone comes along and they say, oh, I was writing some new data to my file and some other thing came along and only read a partially completed torn read. And then the standard advice as always is uh, use atomic renaming to work around the problem. So the idea is, I should just press this. Hmm. So the idea is you create a temp file. And in fact, this is such a common idiom that Linux has recently added this lovely new flag called otemp file. An otemp file will create a completely anonymous new file that does not exist, but does exist. It exists just enough for the purpose of being a temp file, but doesn't appear in the filing system. Either way, you can just use a random name. So in my code, I have a uh, cryptographically strong random number generator, and you spit out a 256-bit random number, and the chances of that ever colliding with anything are extraordinarily low. You then write the data into it, once you finish writing all the data into it, and of course nobody can see your randomly named file because it's so random, unless someone did directory enumeration, which you're not going to go do, you're fine. So the idea is you have some slash foo, some file called foo. It still sits there. You're now creating a new foo file. Let's call it blah. Once you finish writing blah completely, you then do an atomic rename, replacing foo with blah, such that anyone who now comes to look up foo will now see the new updated version. And then anyone who has a file handle open to the previous edition will still see the previous edition up until the last file script to close in the system. Then it'll get deallocated on the file system and be kicked out. It's a classic pattern. Stack Overflow is full of this particular pattern. I assume we've all seen it before. Hands up. Who has? Ooh, a bit less than half. Yes. 
bit less than half has seen this. This is interesting. I thought now all hands would go up if everyone was here for this. So that's good. You've all learned something new. The classic reason why you don't do this in portable code has always been Windows, because Windows didn't provide it. In fact, that's, that's, that's a lie. Windows NT has always provided it since a year dot, but it was never exposed to Win32 up until Vista. And here is the name of the wonderful API. It's set file information by handle using the file rename infrastructure with the flag replace if exists is true. Can anyone say why move file ex is the wrong answer? Anyone able to say that? Nobody? Because move file ex does provide, I will replace this file if it already exists. But does anyone know why move file ex's behavior here is a bad, bad, bad for atomic renaming? Nobody knows? This is correct. Uh, so the question, the point was that the move file ex takes a path, which is not a handle. This is a very good point. There's a second reason, and it's due to the semantics of move file ex. Unfortunately, when it tries to go and rename an item and replace the item that's existing, if it fails, it will then attempt to copy. Because it attempts to copy, it breaks the atomic renaming, ruins your inode thing, and therefore is completely useless. So the correct answer is this completely non-obvious thing. And the reality why is because this actually thunks through to an NT kernel call directly with no, no other change. That's the structure that happens for the NT kernel users, and that's the flag that it uses. So it literally runs straight through. It's, it's a straight through thunk. However, point is that if you're now writing portable code, you can now do atomic renaming in Windows. This is a big thing since Vista. Okay, so uh, time is getting a little short. I am going to quickly take you through and a very quick overview of the four techniques for doing concurrency control on a file system without using locking. <laughs> well, different forms of locking. I'll give you... I probably won't go up to the very last one because the last one is pretty advanced. You know, you could go to a file system conference, you could present on this and your entire room would be packed with people and still only 10% of the people in there would still understand it. So I'm just gonna say, go look at the slides if you're really, really, really interested. Do lots of research on the internet. It gets so hairy after a while. But I'll certainly tell you where they exist. And here are your four patterns. You've all heard of exclusive lock files. They're the standard one. Uh, o exclusive on POSIX or uh, Windows also has a similar thing. So in other words, what you do is when you create a file, you say, please don't let me create this file if something already exists with that same name. And that way then the first person to get there to create a file has the exclusive lock. And they are the person with the ticket that they can do whatever they want. And when you're finished, you simply delete the item. And then the next person who comes along to create the file first is the first person. I'll show you the APIs for that shortly. Second system is byte range locks. Uh, you might think that they are the obvious thing to go do, but there's a very good reason why they're not the right thing to do. And that's because POSIX has one of the most stupid items that POSIX has anywhere in the entire POSIX spec about byte range locks. Um, it is a defect that's been there since 1982. It was a defect that was recognized as an out glaring defect back in 1982. And people said, why the hell are we adding this? Because it's stupid. And they said, because a and t Unix does it. But that's because at and Unix was broken, but we're gonna add it anyway. And it has somehow persisted since then, even though it's completely daft. Luckily, Linux has just recently replaced it. So when I say easy on Windows and Linux, Linux has finally fixed it as of 3.15, and that was due to Jeff Layton just getting really irritated that 25 years have gone past and nobody fixed it, so he just went ahead and did it. Uh, the third pattern is uh, atomic pen plus extent deallocation. So any recent filing system can do this stuff. It is um, amazingly powerful because it's one of the very few ways to portably do late durability. So if you want to do an ACID compliant file system store and you want late rather than immediate durability, uh, this is the way to do it if you want to do it portably. And the final one, and this is the one I probably won't cover because we've run out of time. This is like voodoo magic stuff, ordering guarantees. Um, you will probably grow older by 10 years when you try to program this stuff. You may notice I've become fat and gray recently. Fat, gray, it's because I've spent my time tearing my hair out. And why does X4 behave the way it does? Because the people who wrote it want it to be that way. 
To give you some idea of the relative performance benefits, and I, I stress this is, this is an average guideline, it's not actually accurate. And over here is a uh, logarithmic scale. It's, it's what you should expect. So lock files have this sort of performance. Range locks have much, much more performance. Dependent extents have way more performance again. These are all orders of magnitude, effectively. And the POSIX read-write guarantees the ones where you'll lose all your hair and become very fat and die soon from heart disease. That's, that's crazy performance, but yeah. So this is the one that everybody here should, should be familiar with. Uh, these are exclusive lock files. And as I promised, here's the API to go do them. It's very straightforward. You basically put a while loop. The while loop goes off and tries to create an exclusive file. It will fail if it can't create a file exclusively. Exactly the same thing there is with Windows. You just use create new flag. You also want to specify the file attribute temporary flag because if you don't, you lose about 40% of performance on your lock files on Windows. Because basically Windows needs to know it's really a lock file and not actually a real file that you're writing. And that's how you do. And then it'll go much faster. So if you didn't actually benchmark that, you probably wouldn't know it. <laughs> Uh, this is great. This idiom is really simple. It works everywhere. Network filing systems works between POSIX uh, and Windows all writing to the same network drive. Perfect. Everybody understands them. You can't really complain. But there are some problems. Firstly, they're exclusive or not exclusive. That's the only two things you can do with them. You can't have multiple readers parallelizing. There's a big problem, obviously, if power suddenly gets cut because then you have a stale lock file just sitting there. It's even more complicated because what happens if your system is under a huge amount of load and RAM is short and your swap file is being thrashed and you have some algorithm in place to break stale lock files and that happens to time out and go off and delete the file while something's still using it. That can cause nasty bugs, corruption of data and lost data. Windows doesn't have that problem because it has this lovely delete and close facility. So as soon as, um, this is one of the things I mentioned earlier on, this gets in the way of you deleting a directory hierarchy in a race-free fashion because Files that you delete hang around for a while, but here they're really useful because here you can simply say, well, this lock file, I don't care if this process ever exits or there's ever power loss, always delete this file and it works beautifully. So Windows here is way ahead of POSIX. You have no problem with stale files on, on, on Windows, unless of course you've got some silly loop in your program where your program just hangs, but it's a separate matter. A big problem for, as Chandler would often say, Chandler goes on about power consumption. Well, lock files are terrible for power consumption. If you do a lock file of an Android device, you have no choice but to sit there, loop, 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 no way of sleeping. And because of that, you're just burning the CPU. So it's expensive on CPU and battery. That's trouble with lock files. And these are actual benchmarks. So when I say you can get about 2.5K operations per second on Windows, and the complexity is log waiters. It's 4K on, on Linux, and lovely constant time complexity to waiters. FreeBSD just knocks the ball out of the park, as FreeBSD often does 10K lock file operations. All constant time. Great stuff. Any questions? Waiters is the total number of things trying to claim the lock file. So if you have, uh, okay. So if you have eight things all trying to concurrently write something, that would be the number of waiters. Uh, you can tell that Linux and, and FreeBSD have spent quite a bit of time to do constant uh, complexity to waiters. L Windows less so. The reason why Windows doesn't do it is for uh, the next slide. So byte range locks. Yes? That's the number of lock file operations you can do per second. So that would be a peak on a four core, 3.7 gigahertz um, CPU, Intel CPU. So basically my work machine at home, that's the benchmark I got out. Obviously on a bigger machine you get more. Any other questions? The question was, would it be affected by the SSD versus standard hard drive? Yes, SSDs are slower, which is not what you're going to expect. And do you know why they are slower? The reason why is block size. So almost all SSDs use a 4K block size, whereas the older hard drives use a 512 byte um, block size. And interestingly, lock files have to write out a single block. So therefore, they're writing 4K on a 4K device and 512 bytes on a 512 byte device. And lo and behold, the 4K one is, is actually slower. So any of the newer big hard drives or an SSD are actually slower than a old-fashioned mechanical hard drive, which is just not what you expect. Go on. The, the, 
The question was about mechanical latency and how does that figure into this? The answer is it doesn't figure at all because lock files never exist long enough to ever hit physical storage. So they exist purely in the kernel cache and therefore, but the trouble is because it's a 512K versus 512 byte versus 4K block size, it has to write the memory internally. So that's why you're getting a mem copy effectively and that slows it down. Any other questions? Okay, byte range locks. Yes, these are so much fun. Anyway, you'd think that these are the solution to everything. What you do with byte range locks is you say, I want to lock some offset in by some length for reading or for writing, so exclusive or, or shared. And that just works, except on POSIX. <laughs> Allows non-modifying operations to parallelize, it's fantastic. Automatically unlocks whenever the process exits, even better. Unexpected power off, not a problem. Thread can sleep, so it's not bad for the CPU or battery. Performance is actually about the same as a lock file on Linux. Windows is way faster and with constant time uh, to waiter's complexity. And again, FreeBSD just knocks the ball out of the park. But linear, interestingly, to waiters. So only Windows does a constant time to waiters complexity. Here come the big, big dragons in the corner. As I mentioned, Windows is great, it's even async. So in Windows you can say, I want to lock this region and call me back at some future point when I'm ready. Fantastic. Just love if we could do that in POSIX. I am supposed to write a paper with Jeff Layton on proposing this for POSIX, but it's going to be a while out. Uh, I just keep not finding the time. The great trouble with POSIX that gets in the way of byte range locks is that up until Linux 3.15, on Linux at least, the lock, according to POSIX, has to be per inode on the system. So as soon as you call any close on any file descriptor that refers to the inode, it will simply release all locks on that inode for the process, which is completely brain dead and makes it useless in a multi-threaded process. Because as soon as you have multiple threads, possibly with file descriptors open to the same inode, as soon as anything goes and closes, you've got instant data corruption. Terrible. There are also some problems with cross-platform network shares. So if you have a Samba share, <laughs> God help you if you have a Samba share. But if you did have a Samba share and you tried to do a byte range lock, you have the huge, huge problem that in POSIX, offset and length are signed because why wouldn't they be signed? Because it makes total sense that a byte range lock would be signed on an unsigned length file. So you lop off the top bit and of course POSIX Windows does it correctly with unsigned offsets and extents and therefore you now have a major problem because if you want to lock all of the file from this moment until the end of the file, how do you specify that in a way that Windows and POSIX can both understand when you're locking the top bit off the length and the offset? And the answer is lots of complex code results. And poor old Samba does a whole load of work to go and do that. Question at the back. Oh yeah. Yeah, if you go to the Samba mailing list and you read about what they've done to work around this problem, uh, you will find a whole lot of very sad and despondent people because they get never-ending bug reports from when Microsoft Office went off and did a byte range lock on the Samba drive that was on Linux, and then some other thing was using it, and then it just spazzed all over the file, and then they say, Samba broke and ate my files. And the Samba people say, no, no, we really didn't. It was that it just happened to be really unlucky that these two systems collided in this particular way that ate the file and it's really not our fault and there's a flag you can switch that will make it you know, incredibly poor performance but get it right every time. And they say, but then all our file saves take 10 minutes. <laughs> Question was, are the offset and length specifies 32-bit values? They were once upon a time, a long time ago, but they've been 64-bit for quite some time. Uh, it doesn't still help you because they're still signed. <laughs> that means any, the, the trouble is, is a lot of the time you want to lock uh, from here to the end of eternity on a file. That's a very, very common pattern when you're byte range locking. So from the end of the file currently to any end, to infinite. It's a question of expressing infinite. And the two systems have totally different ways of expressing infinite. So in POSIX, zero length means infinite. On Windows, it does not. But then sometimes zero length does not necessarily mean infinite because there are exclusions. For example, if you read a log, you won't necessarily get back infinity. It's, it's extended. Oh, it just gets so much fun. Uh, and poor old Samba, the Samba developers have really poured so much time and effort into getting this to work properly and oh, horrible. NFS, you'd be glad to know, just gives up. <laughs> 
So NFS makes some attempt to do some locking across POSIX systems, but you're all bets are off if you're trying to get Windows to talk to an NFS share with byte range locks, which makes sense. So um, any questions on that? So the question is, is there any way of knowing if you're talking to such a share on the program? Yes, but the trouble is that Samba can be configured in one of about 20,000 different ways, each with balancing different things of whether, you know, performance comes here or performance comes there. Uh, also, there are different versions of Samba, and different versions of Samba have done different things going throughout history and past. And then sometimes you'll flip something into compatibility mode because, say, Windows XP can't speak the same language as, say, Windows 7 to a Samba share. So there's no way, you can tell you're on a Samba share, but you can't say how it's been configured. That's the great trouble. So, um, yeah. <laughs> any other questions? 10 minutes, okay. All right, I'm gonna flip through the next set of things. We're gonna basically skip it. This is an evil, evil technique which will make your head explode, but is really powerful. You can deliver really fast file system algorithms using this pattern. I'm not going to say very much about it other than say that it really works well. I implemented using this pattern for the AFI review, which I'm gonna mention quite shortly. Um, I used uh, Suzuki because I've used the academics and you can write a distributed mutual exclusion algorithm using just purely atomic append and uh, file extent deallocation. And amazingly, the lock file performance by implementing this algorithm is as fast as byte range locks on the system, except it's completely portable, it runs across Samba, and all systems run equally with it, and you can do multiple lockers because it's constant time to waiters. So, amazingly powerful, but the, it's just mind warping how to implement it in your head when you're converting the distributed uh, algorithms into purely atomic append-based uh, techniques. So, it's simply, I can tell you it works. Um, this is where all the fun happens if you want to go and completely absolve all locking except what the kernel does. So, if you're on a system where you're never, ever, ever on a network drive, ever, and you are on BSD because BSD is sane and lovely, or you're using XFS and Linux because XFS has done a whole lot of extra magic to make it work properly on Linux, or you're on Windows, and this whole technique may work for you, and I'm not going to explain it, I'm afraid. All I'm going to say is that it does a whole lot of stuff which is very similar to atomic lock-free programming on C++. Performance is absolutely superb. You can get millions of locks and unlocks. Anyway, here we are. I'm gonna skip straight to this because we've only got eight minutes left. This is a library that came up that I've been working on for some years. The idea behind it is that we get rid of all of these uh, platform specific differences and we create a unified file system programming model which is portable and just works everywhere. Exactly the same. Works with all features in Windows and Linux. It sacrifices things, like for example, I mentioned earlier that uh, FreeBSD doesn't let you full, uh, pull the full path of a file, only directories. So for example, that facility is not functional. In other words, pulling the path of a file race-free does not work perfectly on FreeBSD. But that's just because of the operating system. And we're not really caring as much as we could do about performance, although performance is important. What we care about is that the system is equal across all platforms. So, what does it provide? It provides a race-free file system API. So, if you want to use the file system TS, but not get any unpleasant, nasty surprises with the races, this could be useful. It provides arbitrary file system backends, so you can say, I want the local hard drive, I want a zip file, I want whatever else, and it's a pluggable, extendable kind of thing. 98% synchronous file system API, and 100% synchronous scatter gather file IO. So it's a bit like ASIO, except it's for files. And of course, it provides error code variants in it. There's other fancy stuff. Go on. Question was, what does 98% mean for an asynchronous file system API? Uh, the answer is that it's 98% because some calls, it makes no sense to make asynchronous. The uh, classic one being atomic rename. That is constant time no matter what. That's very, very fast. So. As, as you said, 98% uh, of the API not necessarily performance. It is, so there's a few calls in there which are synchronous because it makes no sense to make them asynchronous. 
Here are the stuff that it provides. Um, the single biggest thing that's missing out of all of this lovely list of items is the ability to do asynchronous file locks and locking portably. And the reason why is because I need to go rewrite Azio's core reactor first. Yay. And the reason why I need to go do that is because Azio's core reactor, which of course is going to become the networking TS, it unfortunately is built around socket and networking I.O. and trying to get it to do locks doesn't work very well. So I'm going to have to go off and rewrite that at some point, but I'm kind of caught. The reason why is because of coroutines. So Gore's coroutines that are coming for C17, I need those in at least Clang, which is not far off done now, and in Visual Studio, but this one shipping in Visual Studio 2015 currently can't do exception throws. I think they're adding that in update one. So I'll be very shortly able to get started on this, but I'm kind of blocked by other people. I have written a lightweight monadic features library, which is the first chunk of that, and it's much faster than standard features. It also integrates with coroutines and does a whole lot of other fun stuff. I'm gonna write the IO reactor using that. So that's great. That's in the future at some future point. Right now, we've got the current library. It works fine. It's just the new engine will have the same API and just go faster. And that's a while out. So, you now know the library's there. As I mentioned, it went up for a review and it got rejected, so I should mention that. Um, I would say the biggest reason, overwhelmingly, was that I don't make sense to people. <laughs> so in my documentation, the single biggest criticism was, what the hell are you going on about, now? And hopefully this talk probably proves why I just can't communicate. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. We'll see what happens. So what can you quickly do with this stuff? I'm currently caught about what I'm going to present at these conferences next year. I'm either going to present on lightweight futures or I'm going to present on a transactional key value store which builds into the core of the C++ runtime. And I'll just give you some quick look at what fun that might be. Here's my current prototype that I'm currently working with. Here is class data store. You can store a blob, you can find a blob, and you can begin a transaction. So you can create the blob and do that. I'll show you some actual code that's using it in just a second. Here's a transaction. So the transaction lets you look up a key, add a key, and you'll notice the templated key. So it can be any arbitrary key, because it is. And you can commit. If you don't want to commit, simply destroy the transaction, throws it away. Here's some code that's using it. So this is the unit test case that actually uses the code. And it's pretty straightforward. The way you do it is you store some arbitrary blob. These are actually scatter gather buffers. So you can actually supply a gather set of buffers for the blob and it'll just knock it in. This is actually a content addressable database. So the hash, it takes the hash of the content and you can look up the content using the hash. You then begin a transaction. And we're saying here that we're gonna use the index called default, it's a string index. You add Nile maps to a ref, a ref here is a Cistra, and that is simply capital Nile. Same goes to Douglas Clara. And then what you do is you hit commit to make sure it's successful. That's how you write a value. Read, modify, write, start a transaction. Do a read, do a modify, do a commit. The reason why we do lookups in the transaction is because that's how you handle conflict management. So if someone in a concurrent thread came along and had modified Nile, then this transaction would fail because it would say that it's been modified is therefore a spit transaction and therefore we're going to refuse to commit it. And then you can go back, retry it, do it again. And just down here, there's another bit of checking there to make sure that it is in the same state. So that's what I, I might present in this next year if I get it to a point where I'm happy with it, send it in for boost and see what happens, or I might go back to uh, lightweight futures. I honestly don't know, but uh, I think this could be really fun to have in C++. Uh, I think the ability to persist data could be enormous. So thank you very much. And uh, happy to take any questions. Well, I've totally blown your heads. Everyone just seems silent and sort of stunned or something. <laughs> At the back. Say it again, sir. Yeah, so the question was, uh, I'd like to have Unlink able to work directly from file script. Yes. Um, 
So how would you deal with that when it would be working with inodes rather than names? Um, the syntax that I showed there where you pass an empty string, you allow that. The empty string says that I don't care what the name is. So you're saying that the kernel doesn't know which file you no. open, just the inode? Yeah, because there could be a large number of hard links. Yes. So the point is that there could be a large number of hard links. That's okay because any of the existing kernels already have the ability to have... Um, Oh, I see what you mean. So if you want to delete a specific hard link, then you can't because you wouldn't know which one it is because you're referring to the inode. Yes. The way that Windows works around that problem is it keeps a separate inode per hard link, and that's why you're able to delete directly by FD for that. But you made a very valid point, actually. Thanks for that. I think there's another question on the side. No? Not anymore? Okay. Anyone else? I really must have hurt your heads. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everybody.